answer some questions. Tirajan, you mentioned this morning that an arahant can abide and meditate on the emptiness, the sunyata, voidness, vihara. Is that something that other aryas, like stream enterers, once returners, can do? So I asked Tanajananan, the stream enterer who experiences nibbana as part of his path fruition of the path and fruit of stream entry, do they have access to? Nibbana as a meditation experience, and he said, no. So, it is the case that they, they have seen through the self-view. <laughs> Tanajan also said that a stream enterer will find cultivating the jhanas fairly easy. So after the stream entry, when the, probably the largest critical mass of the kilesa falls away at that, at that point, and the rest is a matter of polishing, polishing the, uh, blowing away the last wisps of clouds. But the critical mass of delusion falls away at the stream entry fruit, where the mind cannot fall to a, a low rebirth. So they will be able to remember the insight. They will be able to remember. What, they were, what practice they were doing that led to the insight, they will have unshakable faith, and they will probably have uh, first, second, third, and fourth jhanas, which would be nice. Hachan mentioned that stream enterers have had a cessation experience. So it's a, it, you know, it's sometimes an, it's a three characteristics. So for some people it's anicca, some people it's anatta, some people it's dukkha. It depends which characteristic the mind sees really clearly. And then what happens is Tanajan Anand explains that when the mind sees one of those characteristics very clearly, it sees the other two. And it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because it's impermanent, it's not self. And uh, letting go occurs and emptiness is experienced, emptiness of self, emptiness of permanence, emptiness of grasping. So they experience Nibbana for a period of time. What is it that they are missing compared to an Arahant is that uh, if you want to imagine a light bulb that is perfectly clear and perfectly bright, the stream enterer has the light bulb but they have a greasy smear over it but inside is light and bright and that greasy smear is that last little bit of grasping at things as being a self and that last little bit of greed and hate greed and aversion they don't have hate they they can't be hateful or cruel so the, and the last stages of practice is cleaning that cleaning that off so that uh, Tanajan made an analogy similar to that is a stream enterer capable of breaking precepts in a way that an arahant is not? So, if the stream enterer is born, suppose someone attained the stream, goes to a heavenly rebirth, and then is reborn as a human, it appears to be the case that in taking the human birth, some delusion seeps back into the mind, and some precepts can be broken. The, the stream enterer who is born as a human doesn't know that they're a stream enterer necessarily. But they will have some interesting interesting uh, tendencies. So I believe Ajahn Anand was born as a stream enterer. When he looked at Buddha statues, his, uh, he used to get tears in his eyes and he didn't know why. So as a child, when his mum took him to the temple. So this quality of unshakable faith is uh, just this rapture arising. The little boy doesn't know why, but uh, he's already established his faith in Buddha Dharma and the Sangha very deeply. When he had the stream entry experience in a past life, would have felt enormous gratitude. And uh, there was this song they used to sing at school, kind of like a traditional folk song, which, sing, which is about the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And the kids would sing it at school on the one on the Uposa today. And his hair would go on end. 
and, and tears would stream down his face and he'd ask his friends, does this happen to you? And they're like looking at him like, no. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So, but then his friends, I think Tanajan Dun, Tanajan Biak, similar. I think Ajahn, Anana, Ajahn Dun actually said he believes he was born as a Sakadagami. But I think there was some catching of fish as children. And uh, so it's interesting. Lumpur Biak, I believe he drank beer as a university student. And, but what happens is when these people begin to practice, they progress much faster than other people. And the insight is like re-experienced, and then and from that point on they can't break precepts. Once the uh, dust is thrown off again, the Buddha says those with little dust in their eyes. So once they wash the dust out very fast, and uh, from that point would normally have impeccable virtue. Dear Rajan, what are your thoughts on dreams and how do they relate to practice in the path? So dreams, there's many types, aren't there? I think it's I think it's kind of similar to meditation. You're sitting in your meditation, sometimes there's kind of a, a proliferation which is just nonsense, right? Even when you're trying to meditate. And uh, other times there might be a visual experience which seems to have some meaning. Not everybody has a visual proclivity. In my experience, I've known many monks. Monks who have a particular gift for languages tend to not have much visual experience. It's, it's like the part of the brain, the available mental energy is very good at concepts and structure and can hold several languages in there. The more artistically minded ones who don't like thinking much. You see, remember in the, from what I heard, the Uposada day at Wat Nanachat, some of the old ladies that would sit all night, uneducated rice farmers' wives, would see the ghosts walking around with their ordinary eyes. So they knew which ghosts were in the women's section and which layperson's daughter hadn't been reborn yet. And, but, you know, if they had strong faith, they'd been sitting all night, and their mind got more sensitive, they saw things. And there's all these monks <coughs> practicing really hard, really want to see a ghost, really want to see a David, didn't see anything. <laughs> Some of the monks are asking Lumpur Biak, I want jhana, I want to experience jhana. And he says, well, you have to ask those old ladies that sit all night <laughs> what jhana's like. So I guess the thing with dreams is if it, if it really has a meaning, I'm, I am a bit more of the visual type. And if, it, if it's a lucid dream, there'll be some kind of a feeling of like, that does have some meaning. There was some meaning in that that I'm supposed to decipher. And, uh, and then usually it's not that hard. It's like, but sometimes, sometimes you need help because not everybody has a gift for interpreting kind of dream language or symbolism. I remember when I was in the jungle practicing, the first, first time I went to the jungle on the border of Burma where Ajahn Sri Panya was the abbot, I was having these dreams and they were, really, they were really freaking me out. One dream was like this bus was careering up this mountain on this windy, muddy road and uh, windows were smashing and the seats were falling out <laughs> and it was going faster and faster. And, uh, and I just woke up with, ha! Ah. I'm like, what do I make of that? It doesn't look good. I don't even think there was a driver. I told my friend Ajahn Punyo, he, Ajahn Punyo has a gift for these things, and he says, oh, that sounds like a really good dream. <laughs> I'm like, what was good about it, Ajahn Punyo? He says, well, your habitual views are falling away. The assumptions that you sit on are falling away. You're letting go, seeing things differently. Oh, what a good dream. <laughs> oh, okay, well, glad he was there to encourage me, because for me it just like we were going to go off the cliff at any second. <laughs> but I think he might have been onto something. 
And then there was another time I was scooping out this muddy water and there was hardly any water left. And then I suddenly found a couple of goldfish or orange carp in the bottom of the pond. And I woke up with this terrible feeling, oh no, the fish are going to die. And I had to consult my, my dream medium, Ajahn Punyo. What do you think this dream means, Ajahn? Oh, that's a really good dream. <laughs> What's good about it? Well, scooping out the dirty water is good, right? And gold, gold means insight, right? Among all this scooping out of all the dark stuff, there's beginning to have some real insight. Now you just need to pour the clear water in. Oh, sadhu ajan punyo. So sometimes, you know, some, but it's normally if we practice quite hard, we can have these interesting dreams. And uh, when I was on my first Tudong, on my first pilgrimage in India, it was a difficult, we were having a difficult time because it was the coldest winter in a hundred years. And uh, we were in Sarnath, the Thai temple in Sarnath, and we didn't, we hadn't realized it, but the, the monks had to pay 500 rupees every time they went in if they came from it. Western country, it's like India's revenge on uh, India's revenge on uh, what do they call them? On the Raj, on the. <laughs> if you were from India, you could pay five rupees. We didn't have a single rupee, so we'd gone all the way there to spend a week practicing at the deer park, and we couldn't go in. But there was this little Jain temple that comes in a little bit close to the Dharmika stupa, so we were kind of sitting at the gates of the Jain temple looking at the... <laughs> so, but I wanted to keep my rules strictly. I believe that not handling personal funds, keeping a strict standard of vinya means that the blessings of the lineage will protect you. So I didn't want to, because probably could have found a Thai person who would give us a bunch of money if they knew we didn't have any, but we couldn't tell people we didn't, we didn't have a steward. And then as I was waking up, I had a dream of Lumpur Man. Lumpur Man, the first time I saw him. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a vision so much as it was him. It was him, he, and, he, and he was smiling. He was so pure. And I think it was related to the fact that we were keeping our rules strictly. So, okay, we couldn't go and meditate in at the deer park, but I felt that the blessings of the lineage were taking care of us. So sometimes these nice things happen. And uh, in general, if, if, it's, if it's not clear that there's a really clear and obvious meaning or it doesn't seem particularly profound, I would just, similar to thoughts, know it and let it go. Know it and let it go, don't think about it too much. But if it's interesting, then if you can't work it out yourself, you might ask your teacher. So, yeah. One of the monks dreamt that a big snake came and bit them. And he killed it. You have to ask Ajahn Punya what it means, yeah. <laughs> so is it... <laughs> In Thai, a snake biting isn't good, but it wasn't poisonous and he killed the snake, so interesting. Dear Ajahn, sometime I used to sit meditation and experience cool and pleasant abiding. A three hour sitting felt like 20 minutes. It takes only a few minutes to enter an enclosure like, like going into an envelope and close inside. What kind of stage is this? So that does sound like it may be the first absorption. And uh, many people explain it as, yeah, as being within a sphere, being enveloped by a kind of a cool peacefulness that things don't penetrate. Other people describe it as like falling into a well and uh, not, you know, not getting injured, like... <laughs> falling into a deep, cool place where sounds uh, seem a long way away. And uh, it's a little bit tricky because 
There's another state called Bawanga, which is a sleepy state. Some people, like Ajahn, Yana, Ajahn Sunanda was telling me the other day that uh, Ajahn Nyanadamo, when he was the abbot of Watnanachat, was asking the monks, how's your morning meditation? Oh, good, yeah, I seem to go into peace quite quickly. How's your meditation? I seem to go quite peace quite quickly. And then he had to tell them, you know, when I look around and watch you guys meditating in the morning, you're all like this. <laughs> <laughs> so what's being experienced as a peaceful state you know, I wake up, feel very refreshed. <laughs> so, then we have to have enough mindfulness to notice. If if mindfulness is good, even if you fall asleep, when you wake up, you'll feel the pain in the neck. You'll notice the dribble of spit. <laughs> so, if there's pain in the neck and a dribble of spit, you know it uh, probably wasn't the first jhana. But it could be. So, the the, the thing to notice is: is there a is the quality of peace profound? So, in the in these meditation states, they they are timeless, which is why it seems like it goes fast. There's a sense of self that perceives time. If there isn't much of a sense of self, and if peace becomes the object, then coming out of the meditation, it can seem like it went very fast. So that could, but sleep can can be similar. People have a nap, wake up, no, that went very fast. So, yeah, it's a, if it was real samadhi, the feeling of rapture, not rapture, what's the word? Tranquility. The feeling of tranquility should linger for some significant amount of time. So if, if when you're walking around after your meditation and your body feels light and your mind feels light and the hindrances are still quite subtle, there's not many coarse, unwholesome thoughts, then it's probably samadhi. If you feel, oh, that was a really good sit, and then you start having all sorts of hindrances and desires and irritation, then it probably wasn't. So a few things to observe after meditation as well. I have that interesting experience myself when I tend to get, one of the reasons I like to go to India is I tend to get some nice results in my meditation if I'm doing eight to ten hours a day for weeks at a time. have this interesting experience of walking back to the guest house. It's kind of, it's less crazy than it used to be, but it used to be buses, tuk-tuks, uh, tractors pulling kind of trolleys full of bricks, and uh, I don't know how many times a truck went past and a tray of bricks missed my head by millimeters and makes me believe that protective de devas exist in India. And, uh, but you know, beggar kids, hawkers, and if the meditation had gone well, walking back to the guest house for a kilometer with nothing impinging and just loving everybody. Oh, dirty beggars. Oh, hawkers. Oh, I nearly died. And um, <laughs> <laughs> because the result of having had you know, periods of some good samadhi, there's still the, it's probably, a, the mind may probably still in an upajara state still experiencing rapture, tranquility, and tend to feel a lot of gratitude. Gratitude is such a beautiful, wholesome mind state. So it's, oh, I love the Buddha, I love the Dhamma, I love the Sangha, I love everybody. And uh, so, yes, I think if it's, if it's real samadhi, there will be something like that afterwards. It's a way of checking. And uh, sounds good, though. Dear Ajahn, this morning Ajahn mentioned there are people with samadhi but have not so much mindfulness. Can Ajahn please explain more? So, if a person in this is this would be the people who've cultivated samadhi in past lives and the ones that seem to get samadhi easily and have really good samadhi. So, that can be dependent on a lot of sense restraint. So, typically, if you if you wander up to the top of the mountain and you only eat berries and leaves. For a period of 10 years and you put a lot of effort into your practice, your mind will eventually, if you're very sincere, find some peaceful, radiant, very radiant states. And you can, but it's, all, it's like the samadhi is dependent upon the indriya samwara, the sense restraint and the effort and the lack of impingement of other things. Not, not seeing people, so not getting a lot of discursive conversations. And uh, yeah, Arjuna Nan once told me the Brahma Devas are the most difficult to teach because 
they have what they have is good. They have this vast, profound radiance streaming from their mind. Like they have really cool names, like resplendent glory, refulgent glory. It's like, hi, I'm ref- I'm refulgent glory. <laughs> What's your name? You know? So, <laughs> and um, just this streaming radiance, this profound samadhi, and they, the sense of self is wholesome. Like they don't, they're not experiencing hatred or lust because they have the capacity to suppress the hindrances. So the the samadhi suppresses the hindrances, but the seeds of Achilles are still there. But the samadhi su- suppresses the hindrances, so they don't they don't experience coarse craving or irritation. So the mind has that level of purity that's coming from suppressed hindrances. But there's still a self view functioning there, and they're and they're not seeing anicchang and dukkang. They're so adept at samadhi that if there's a little bit of discomfort, they just go back into the absorption. So rather than investigate the discomfort, they can just go back into the absorption. So Tanajan was saying, if they, and it's usually these characters that end up on top of mountains eating berries and leaves, they, at their death, go to the Brahma realm. They get so attenuated with those samadhi states, so familiar with them, the mind inclines towards them, and then they come back down again, they find the home life insufferable, they leave as soon as they can, they head back to the mountain, they eat the leaves and berries, they die, they go back to the Brahma realm. And uh, it's very, very difficult. Like the, the point of insight, the point where insight is experienced is usually in the Upajara Samadhi state, before jhana. So the practitioner actually has to have some ability to stay with a significantly peaceful mind with very subtle hindrances without going into the absorption. That's the middle way. That's where the reflection on the three characteristics or the nature of the body occurs. But if a person's samadhi is so adept, one in-breath, they're in jhana, that person has more difficulty contemplating impermanence. And uh, it was interesting, apparently, when Ajahn Dhan, Ajahn Anand and Ajahn Biak were practicing together, Ajahn Dan was saying, you need to contemplate permanence constantly, you need to contemplate death, you need to contemplate. And Ajahn Biak was like, I can't contemplate, my mind just goes into samadhi. You need to sit samadhi a really, really long time, he said. And then Ajahn Anand was kind of in the middle. He said, no, I can concentrate or I can contemplate. And these three different characters with three different styles. And they all made it work for themselves. So people are different. So it is possible for a person to have more samadhi than sati because the sati is that which knows things according to their characteristic. Mindfulness has a quality of being aware of the characteristics or the natures of things. So mindfulness is what sees impermanence. Mindfulness is what is aware of unsatisfactoriness. And so it's possible that some people have more samadhi. It's also possible that if we have a lot of sati, the rest of the question is, I can understand how a person has a lot of mindfulness and no samadhi, but not the other way around. So, samma sati will lead to samma samadhi. Because uh, that, what, that actually seems to be the emphasis of Lumpur Chah's training of the monastics, is the samma sati. When, when Ajahn Chah is training people to be mindful in every posture, so, you know, Ajahn Chah isn't around anymore and his monastery became famous and When he was around, it was uh, obviously different to how it is now, of course. But he was very, very strict with how the monks deport themselves. So the monks weren't allowed to talk loudly when they're in the sala. The monks weren't allowed to talk when they were walking past another monk's kuti in case the monk was talking. There was a particular, you had to take your shoulder bag off your shoulder before you entered the hall, carry it in your hand. You had to place it down lightly. You had to bow when you went into the sala, bow when you left the sala, bow when you came to your kuti, bow when you leave your kuti. So he was training people to be mindful of what they're doing with their body, with their speech, with their with their requisites. Very strict about where the requisites could be put, so people wouldn't mix them up and all sorts of things. And uh, the the emphasis on making sure there's a lot of rules. Like he had his own. There's the 227 monks rules, but then there were the monastic etiquette rules of which there were a lot. The time to sweep, the way to ring the bell, the way to serve the food, the way to wash the bowl. Everything had a, a right way, and if you did it wrong, you got scolded. 
And so the monks, you know, the monks were on their toes. And there was a right way and a wrong way to do everything. And I remember training at Nanar Chad as a novice. It was so oppressive because everything, everything was you have to, you have to, you have to, you can't, you can't, you can't. And the monks would say, Nen, come here. Don't do it like that. <laughs> Nen, come here. I told you to do it like this. I don't even call you a name. Nen, Nen, Mani. Novice, come here. And I'd be kind of sneering. Oh, <laughs> that guy again. <laughs> Won't mention any names. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that when you, there's a right way to do everything and a wrong way to do everything, then it keeps you on your toes. You tend to notice what you're doing with your body, with your speech, with your requisites. And, uh, and you know, when you see that a mindset is suffering, when you have consistent mindfulness, you get some skills at putting it down. When you're able to put down a, a, suffer, um, a mind state that produces suffering, you experience peacefulness. So um, the Samma Sati, and also he did make the monks sit after the chanting, and he made them sit during long talks, and he made them sit after the evening chanting. So there was plenty of opportunities for the mind to collect. But his emphasis seems to have been on the Samma Sati, leading to Samma Samati. And, uh, which we are all grateful for. Dear Rajan, I practice giving with sincerity, but I do find myself feeling reluctant at times, aversive when I am the receiver. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I remember I had a... When I was a novice living with Ajahn Samedo, in Amarawati, one monk gave me a, was giving me a beautiful cashmere sweater, so soft. And I said, oh, I don't know if I should take that. I'm sensual. You should give me an itchy sweater, an old sweater. And Arjun Samedo says, take it, Achalu. I said, oh, but it's too beautiful. I'm worried I'll get attached to it. And he says, you'll get over it. <laughs> But I haven't yet. <laughs> anyway, it was nice that he had faith. <laughs> what was the point? The point was, yeah, so I, actually I think being able to receive a gift is, is important. And uh, what, I guess what one has, to, one has to investigate is it that is it that you're trying to keep a strict standard of renunciation and you don't want to collect clutter? Is it that you're trying to pre practice being simple and uh, not have unnecessary things and it's just more stuff? You know, it could be that. If it's, but that, that's the thing to investigate. Is there a withholding of loving kindness towards oneself? Is there a self-flagellation aspect to this? Is it that I, I don't feel worthy so I shouldn't be given gifts? So you know, one has to do a bit of investigation. But I do believe that being able to receive a gift graciously is, makes it possible to give more gifts graciously as well. There's definitely a link. And uh, so I think, and it's also inevitable. Like if you are a generous person, part of it is understanding karma. If you're a generous person, stuff is coming back. I remember I offered, Ajahn was very, my good fortune, Lumpur Blian went to Bodh Gaya and his Upatak didn't bring a sitting mat just his sitting cost. I had one. Venerable, I met Venerable Moshe on the entrance. Publian's coming. I joined them for the evening chanting. I gave him my sitting sitting mat. And uh, I came here not long afterwards to start an undergiri. <coughs> it was, we, was, we were living in it. We just had a tent. We didn't have any kutis. A tent that, that blew away, I was mentioning the other day. Somebody came and offered 20 sitting meditation mats. And... Uh, I think it was about a month later, somebody came and offered another 20 sitting meditation mats. There were three monks, 40 meditation mats. <laughs> and uh, another, one thing that was really bizarre, we'd been here one month, we had no cooties. Somebody wanted to offer an industrial sewing machine. And I said to her, we don't even have electricity or, or a place to put it. What, what am I going to do with an industrial sewing machine? It's okay, it's okay, you'll get it, you'll get it. I really want to offer it. I think it was part of her job to sew things. 
So she did. She offered an industrial sewing machine and I had to keep it in a resort down the road until we had a place to put it. It was a year later. But the <laughs> I don't know, maybe I gave a sewing machine. And a few years later we said we want one of those we want one of those uh, pedal sewing machines. So in case some monks like to, it's a good way to practice without electricity, it's nice and simple. We actually used to learn at Wat Nanachat with that method. And uh, we told this person, could we please have an old-style pedal sewing machine? She said, yes, yes. And she, ind- she offered us an industrial sewing machine. So I think we have three now. So three industrial sewing machines for five months. So I think we pro- somebody gave a sewing machine to somebody somewhere. Yeah, in the past, I'm sure. So another interesting thing happened was, uh, as many of you know, I gave away prints of lotus paintings. So uh, when, uh, Ezra from Singapore arrives with this big picture he wants to give me. Two meters fifty-five by one meter thirty, a tanka from Nepal, the life story of the Buddha. I didn't ask for it. But I'm thinking, well, if you're going to start giving away beautiful pictures, beautiful pictures are going to be coming back. <laughs> it's, uh, so part of it is that we, we do have to understand that uh, that's one of the nice things about being a, a fairly well-supported monastery is we we sent some villagers down to the orphanage in Lomsak yesterday. They were going to a katina ceremony nearby and they took our leftover juices, noodles, sweets and uh, milks. When we come out of the rainy season, there's a they call it a takpat devo. There's a big ceremony where a lot of people put food in the monks' bowls the day after the rains retreat. So when some, when you have too much stuff, it's when it's a nicer it's a nicer challenge than not having enough. I think where you can bring some happiness to the, to other people. And uh, fortunately for me, Ajahn Sunando likes sorting through our storeroom and finding stuff to give away. And he's like, ask me, can I give this away? Yes. Can I give this away? Yes. Give it away. And uh, so you have to work with it. If you're generous and if you're kind, it's coming back. And so learn to be gracious. Sometimes, you know, it's like, yeah, there's this humility in, sometimes you want to be, you think it's hum, humble to not take stuff. But if the person really wants to give you something and you actually don't want it, sometimes the humble thing to do is to take it. Because it's like you're giving them happiness and you're not thinking about your preferences. And then when they've gone away, you can give it to someone else, right? A bit of regifting, of recycling and regifting. <laughs> the monks do it all the time. And uh, <coughs> But yeah, have a check. Is it because you want to keep simple frugal standards or is it because there's some self-aversion? And uh, just understand the law of karma. What you give out will come back. Normally multiplied. So uh, we have to roll with it. So we're for this for your reflection. You can sit meditation together now.